Hello, I just wanted to make a, a pretty brief video. This isn't going to be, you know, a full, long uh, explanation. Um, but I just wanted to make to make a few points in response to uh, John Verveke's response to my video. Um, so ultimately, we're going to be doing a, a discussion together. We're, we're setting up dates. I just got an email from him about that. And uh, so we're going to try to do something together. And ultimately, when you have these kinds of conversations, um, it's usually not the best thing to just go back and forth. You know, with talks, I give a talk and then he does one and we kind of rebut each other from a distance or something. Um, <laughs> and a lot of those kind of things can happen on YouTube and, and via podcasts. And I just don't know that it's the most helpful thing. So uh, the, the goal certainly is to, is to have, you know, conversation. And it looks like that's where this is going. So so I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to uh, kind of see what, what happens as uh, we, we move forward into doing that. Um, but I just wanted to make a couple points in response to the video before that dialogue to, to kind of set things up and clarify a couple things. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Verveke, some of his you know viewers are not at all familiar with me and probably didn't see my video and, and just watched his. And, you know, it's probably the same thing on my end <laughs> with the things that I, that I played and people hadn't watched the, the original lecture either. But it does seem like there there is a bit of, of overlap there. So um, just to, to clarify a couple things uh, in response to what uh, Dr. Verveke uh, said in his presentation. You know, the, the first thing I want to say is just like I appreciate his uh, tone and, and demeanor in dealing with this. I appreciate that he took the uh, talk in the manner that it was intended uh, that, that, you know, I'm really trying to open up room for, for dialogue and, and discussion. Uh, I think that this is, there are some issues that are really important underneath this, this disagreement. I think that we have on this issue. Ob obviously we have some very similar stances on, on a lot of, a number of issues, but uh, this I think does reveal some, some significant differences. So when it comes to things that really matter, really significant differences, I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to engage and to, to dialogue back and forth. So the goal of this was always to dialogue, not just to bash somebody. And I think he certainly took it that way and he responded in kind, which I very much appreciate. And I think the reason why, you know, I responded the reason why I responded to Verveke in the first place is because a number of people who who do listen to to my talks and watch my videos had pointed me toward his lecture on on Luther, and they were concerned about some of the the presentation there. So so it's not something that I you know went out of my way to find. It's something that I had people um, point out to me. Now just to give clarity, maybe for those who are not familiar with me, uh, if I can give a little bit of clarity about what I do. I mean my my whole life is really devoted to. Um, defending and promoting the Lutheran intellectual tradition, like that's that's what that's what I do, that that's my calling in life. That is what I spend my time doing. I'm a president of a, of a Lutheran theological seminary, but I also uh, run this organization, Justin Center, which has this YouTube channel as well as a publishing house, putting out you know older Lutheran materials. But a large part of of what I do in my mission in doing that is to recover an older Lutheranism that. It goes behind what I think are a lot of 20th century mischaracterizations of Luther. And I think those mischaracterizations of Luther come particularly out of Kantian and then neo-Kantian interpretations of the reformer that, that I don't see as accurate with Luther's own writings or his own theological influences or those who immediately inherited the tradition coming after Luther. So when it comes to something like a presentation like Dr. Verveke's, this really hits on my area of expertise, right? This is my passion. So, uh, so you, I think you're going to, you see that probably coming across. I'm certainly passionate about, about these issues. And I know that, uh, Paul Vanderclay commented something like that about, <laughs> like you can see uh, in my, my hand motions, how passionate I get about modernist interpretations of Luther. And that's, that's true. <laughs> Uh, you know, my, my dissertation was was on this issue. So, uh, my dissertation was covering, uh, you know, some philosophical questions and how we read Luther, which was really a rejection of using more neo-Kantian models to formulate Lutheran theology and trying to go back to more classical realist models from from Plato and Aristotle, Neoplatonism, and whatnot. So just to give you some context as to why that, that really matters to me as much as it does. Um, so the second thing that, that I want to point out is in the, you know, in, in the, the talk or in the response, the beginning of it was basically that, that Dr. Verecki was making the claim that he's using, he's discussing kind of historical genealogy and he's trying to make what is a very common kind of historical argument that, you know, one thing caused another thing, caused another thing, caused another thing. And that doesn't mean that Luther is self-consciously doing all of the things that then resulted from, say, the Reformation or, or his, his ideas. Um, so the critique was largely that 
it, you know, while I was depending on Luther's writings, perhaps I'm accurately representing Luther, he's really speaking more so about the historical influence of Luther and what happened, you know, centuries kind of down the line, almost like, a, you know, one domino falls and the rest kind of end up falling as well. Now, I, I want to say that I'm certainly not not opposed to that kind of argument. I make those kind of arguments all the time. So uh, anyone who's familiar with my work knows that knows that I make those kinds of arguments. And, and I have made that type of argument when dealing with uh, people like Rene Descartes or when I'm dealing with uh, medieval nominalism. Uh, I, I do want to say I think that anytime you blame kind of one historical idea for a lot of problems, and, and my tendency is probably to do this with nominalism, uh, <laughs> I always try to be aware that like there, it's a lot more complex than that because any historical movement and, and major shift culturally is going to have a, a the number of factors. So it's not just going to be one one thing, nominalism or Luther or whatever. And I'm not saying that Dr. Brakey was saying that. Certainly his, his whole series talks about a lot more than Luther. <laughs> uh, but some Roman Catholics do seem to do that with, with Luther, I think, which is a bit frustrating. So so I understand that that kind of argument. But, but my response is that first I would say the talk does make a number of, of claims about Luther. And and I think that was downplayed a bit in the response. And, and you know, Brakey's not a expert on Luther. And I, of course, of course he's not. He wouldn't claim to be. Uh, and, and he's, I think, largely reading those interpreters of Luther that I have spent my life work just trying to say are wrong. <laughs> so, uh, so because I think they're, I think they're wrongly interpreting, interpreting Luther. So, so I, I will say that I think when you listen to his talk, it's more than just that kind of historical genealogy. And I'm going to say genealogical, I'm not meaning it in the Foucaultian kind of sense. But uh, I think he's doing a little more than that because he is certainly making claims about, about Luther's own theology. But but the second part of pushback that I would have to that is, it, and this is a you know historical thesis a lot of people have had, to be fair, right? So Brad Gregory, Unintended Reformation, people talk about this book all the time, that there are these unintended consequences of the Reformation. Now, I'm not going to say that they're all wrong, uh, and I'm not going to say that there are no dangers in Protestantism generally. I think that the, the fracturing of the church at the time of the Reformation was not was not all a good thing. Fracturing of the church is never a good thing, but I think it was the necessary thing because the truths that Luther stood up for were important enough to stand for them anyway. So, and I know Roman Catholics will, will contest that kind of claim, but so, so I'm not going to say that nothing negative came out of the Reformation, okay? But with that being said, I do want to say that the, the kind of nominalist readings of Luther and the, the readings of Luther on so his, his talk, he mentioned things about, you know, kind of Luther leading toward double predestination. And he didn't want to get into the weeds theologically, but that is a, that, that, that is a claim that's often contested in Luther's scholarship. But I want to say that my interest has largely been looking at the next generation of Lutheran theologians. Now, why is that so important to me? Well, a couple of reasons. One is I'm a Lutheran, meaning that I hold to the Lutheran tradition. I'm not one who thinks that we can hold Martin Luther above, you know, every other other thinker in church history and just submit to everything he says. We got stuck with the name Lutheran, but that's because it was placed on us and we just kind of accepted it because it kept we kept getting the label. Uh, is it the best term? No, but it is what it is. So, so that you know, it, it's fine. It's what we have, but there could be kind of a misunderstanding because of that. So, so I would say as a Lutheran, I define myself by the Lutheran confessional documents. We have a number of uh, the Book of Concord, which contains our, our teachings. So that's that's one reason why I care a lot about these these next generation Lutherans. But another reason is precisely because I think that it's really important for those those kinds of arguments that are being made that say Luther led to, you know, secularization or Luther led to whatever kind of thing you want to say that Luther led to because you have to make in order to make that kind of argument, you have to show a kind of one domino hits another, hits another, hits another, hits another, right? And and I think that kind of argument necessitates that type of thing. And in order for that to be the case, I think what we would have to see is the next generation of Lutherans doing that, right? Being being a kind of next domino that falls down. And when you see that next generation of Lutherans, they're really not doing that. So the I mean, they're they're very much more self consciously than Luther himself was scholastic in their thinking in their methodologies. So the 17th century era of, of Lutheranism is largely a kind of neo scholasticism. People refer to it as a Protestant scholasticism, where there is a recovery of a lot of ancient philosophy, classical realism. There is a lot of use of Aristotle, a lot of use of of Plato, Plotinus. If you read someone like Johann Gerhard, who's my favorite theologian, you find a lot of this. And, and natural law. Natural law theory is really 
significant in, in this era. So what you don't really see is these kind of natural causes of what Luther is supposed to have caused for you know over a hundred years. I mean you've got it's really not until the 1700s that the dominoes start to fall down. So my question for those who are kind of making this historical argument is where do you find that in the the 1600s? And if you don't, how is it that we jump from Luther to then when you get to like Kant, somebody like that? And Kant was raised in a pietism. And pietism, I think, is a significant factor here as well. I also think Calvinism is a significant factor. I also think that some of the responses of the Counter-Reformation are a significant factor for where we end up. I think there are a number of factors. So can you say that kind of the loss of a magisterial authority was, you know, had something to do with the, you know, divisions that occur in the West? Well, yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, that just seems kind of historically to be the case. But I don't think that means that then all of the implications of what is often claimed about Luther can really be blamed on Luther. I think it's really a number of much later, I'm talking 19th century readings of Luther, that start to to put these pieces together, I think that lead to a lot of societal collapse in, in the Protestant world and adoption of modernistic philosophies. But I don't think that that is a fair reading of Luther. And I don't know that you can blame Luther for that because I think the influences on those individuals are other than Luther and they go back and read it into Luther. So that's just the, the basic points that I want to make in response right now. Uh, and I want to set the groundwork there a little bit for those who aren't familiar with me and to set some of the groundwork for the conversation. So uh, I, I look forward to the conversation. I think it's going to be going to be fun. I don't know when the date of it is. Uh, ho hopefully Dr. Verveke gets a chance to look at my book a little bit to see a little more where I'm coming from. Uh, before the conversation, I'm going to make sure to watch some more of his videos as well. So hopefully we can be on a kind of decent ground <laughs> of uh, understanding uh, where where the other is, is coming from. Uh, and one final thing maybe I want to say is, you know, people ask, like, why are you dealing with these guys? They're not even theologians, and you respond to these people. It's not, like, fair, because that's, you know, that's my expertise. It's not, it's not this area of expertise. And, and you know, people ask me the same thing with, with Peugeot as well when we when we had that conversation, because I kind of pressed him on some theological issues, and he said, I'm not a theologian. When he, he's not. Uh, but the the reason why I do that is because, well, Verveke and, and people like Verveke and Peugeot are not are not theologians, and Jordan Peterson as well. Uh, you know, they're not they're not theologians, but they do make claims that are often cross disciplinary. So they do affect the field of theology. And and I'll just say this is a lot of from my my personal experience, which you know, for those who don't know, don't know me again. Um, I spend a significant amount of time doing uh, ministry at Cornell University with with students, specifically a lot of male students, Christian students, more conservative leaning students for the most part, and in a lot of those conversations, and these are Ivy League students, very thoughtful people, they're, they look for kind of thoughtful people to engage or to listen to, to think through um, their, their Christian faith or just cultural issues that are going on. And so they are often drawn toward the people like uh, John Verveke and Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Peugeot and people like that. So, so often I'm asked questions regarding what they say theologically. So there are theological claims within what they're saying. So insofar as they're making theological claims, I do think it's fair to, to respond to those theological claims, especially because people are hearing them, and I'm hearing this all the time, people are hearing them as, as theological minded people. And, and I'll say, you know, I'm as much as I'm a theologian, I, I make claims in other fields as well. Insofar as they overlap with theology, I try very hard not to go beyond my expertise too far, because I know I'll probably make an idiot out of myself in doing that. <laughs> but but I think when I do that too, I think it's also fair to, to give a response. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Hopefully this was helpful and uh, look forward to having the dialogue in the future. God bless.